Good morning. Good morning. So we got 43 people logged in. That's pretty good. Um, if you could, if you uh, could just say hello in the chat box so I have a record of you being here since the polling thing still doesn't work right. So I'm not going to make you guys go through that today. So um, then I'll get a list of all the names in the chat box. All right. Hopefully you got lots of coffee. It's going to be kind of a long lecture today. I'm going to try to see how much of chapter 21 we can finish. So we're going to um, start where we left off. Now, when I'm talking, if you have a question, feel free to unmute your mic and ask the question. You can also try to put it in the chat box if you don't want to talk. Okay, so that'll be fine. Um, if you're not talking, please mute your microphone so we don't get any background noise. Okay, even if you're in a quiet area, you know, there might be your phone ringing or something like that. So I'm recording this. I think I'm recording this. Um, let me make sure I am. Yeah, I think I'm recording it. So, um, so as a result, you know, I'm going to do a little bit of post-production, get rid of some of the junk in the presentation, and then I'm going to post it on YouTube. And it'll be um, unlisted. So the link you'll find for the lecture will be in the um, in learn okay and I'll send out a message to everyone when that gets posted it takes a little bit of time to do that now on Thursday we will not have an online lecture okay I'm helping out a colleague so they can have a guest presenter on failure, failure analysis and it happens to be at the same time we have this class Okay, so I will be posting some things for you to do between now and Thursday so you can use that time to get other things done. Okay, and I might post a quiz as well during that time. So I know you're all available from between 9.30 and 10.45. So I may give you a short quiz on the reading or something, okay? Oh, we got some more people I have to let in. All right, for those of you who just joined, please put, uh, just say hello in the chat box so I have a record in the chat box that you're here. All right. Okay. So let me see here. So I'll be posting a reading quiz for chapter 21. Um, I don't know when I'll get that done, but it probably, I'm going to shoot for having that ready to go on Thursday. Okay. All right, so from part one of the lecture, which we did live in class before the corona coma that we're in now, um, you know, we learned about surface roughness and we talked a little bit about how long it takes to remove a certain amount of volume um, from, a, from a material. And so I want you to review that and kind of refresh your memory. Um, I'll be posting the updated slides um, probably today. And, but the, the slides already online are, are good enough, right? You can actually, um, actually use those for, for, from the last lecture to catch up. Okay, no, no questions yet. All right, I'm gonna have to move some of my chat boxes around so I can see the slide. Now, you guys can all see the, the slides pretty well, correct? Um, yes, yes, sir, yep, okay. So that's good. I hope they're clear on your, on your device. If you're using a phone, you're gonna probably need a magnifying glass for some of these, but um, if you're using a laptop, it should be pretty good. Okay. Um, all right. So, you know, we talked last time when we're cutting the, the material, um, the gray 
triangle here. I hope you can see my, um, well, let's try this. I'm gonna try a few more things today. So if you look at this region here, okay, that's the tool right here. So you can see the tool. Okay, and when it's being pushed into the material, right, you get, typically you get a shear plane forming. But sometimes you don't get a, um, a shear plane, you'll get a, a, what's called a shear zone. Okay, so the shear zone happens um, when the material um, doesn't, doesn't come off in planes very easily. Okay, so you see the, the tool here, it's being driven at a velocity, a certain velocity that is determined by your tool settings, right? And the depth of cut, T naught, is also determined by your tool settings. And as you're cutting into the material, you can either have very well-defined shear planes or you'll have a shear zone, okay? And we'll show some videos on that in a little bit, okay? So here you're seeing something that's called a built-up edge starting to form here, okay? So if you take a closer look at it, all right, so this angle alpha here, if you look at it, it's, it's the angle between the perpendicular to the work for surface or the orthogonal line to the work surface. So if you extend that line all the way down to the work surface, you'll see it's at a right angle. And it's the angle between that perpendicular with the um, plane of the tool, okay, the rake face of the tool. So the rake face is where the, the chip is gonna rake across the tool as it's being formed, okay? So you can adjust the rake angle um, when, you're, when you're doing machining, okay? So that's something you can adjust. So, you know, think about that. Is that a dependent or an independent uh, variable? Okay. Independent, right, because you're, you're actually controlling that. Okay, so I'm just reiterating what I just said. The, the angle between the rake surface of the tool and the orthogonal to the workpiece surface, that's the rake angle. So that's alpha, okay? And then how can you adjust the rake angle? Well, you can change the orientation of the tool relative to the workpiece, okay? So that's, that's pretty straightforward. Now, when you do that, you're gonna be um, creating chips, right, when you're machining. So the chips that you form will have a certain chip thickness, okay? And that thickness is determined by the depth of cut, the angle of the tool, and all of these other parameters, right? Okay, so um, yeah, most of you got it right. D or um, B is the correct answer. D is not the same as the chip thickness. D is actually the difference between the shear planes. So as you're pushing on the material, right, you're going to form a shear. And that D distance is the distance between the individual shear planes. The chip thickness is actually from about here to here. Okay, I hope you can see my cursor, okay? So it's from there to there. So that's the chip thickness. Is that gonna be the same as the, as the um, depth of cut from, from, uh, from here to where you're actually cutting down to here? So this would be the depth of cut. It's not the same, right? Okay, so the D, to recap, the D is the distance between the shear planes and you shouldn't confuse it with the um, chip thickness. Okay, in this cartoon here, D is grossly exaggerated in the image, right? It's actually much, much thinner. So D is, is actually much thinner. It's on the order of 10 to the minus third to 10 to the minus fourth inches. So one ten thousandths of an inch to, to one thousandths of an inch, okay, in that range. All right, that's typically what the, this, the differences between the shear planes as you're machining. And that'll make more sense as we look at a few more, um, as we look at a few more of the uh, um, videos coming up.
Okay, and then you have what's called a cutting ratio. And this, this is a good way to determine um, how well you're cutting. So a lot of times machinists will look at that cutting ratio and make sure that it doesn't go completely out of whack um, because when it starts to, to drift, um, then your machine parameters are, are varying and you'll have trouble with your surface fin finish and the accuracy of your cut. Okay, so if you take a look at this equation for cutting ratio, you've got depth of cut divided by chip thickness or chip width, right? And that, that's a certain ratio, and you can look at it as a combination of those two angles we talked about, right? The shear angle and then the rake angle determines also what the cutting ratio is. Um, so those are the variables you can control, okay? Um, actually, you control the rake angle. The shear angle is really determined by the tool shape and what the material is, okay? So if you look at this, um, will the cutting ratio always be less than one or will it be greater than one? What do you think? So put that in the chat box. Most of you are saying it's A, okay? So let's think about that, right? This is the depth of cut, this is the chip, thickness, right? So if you look at the picture, you see the depth of cut here, T0 or T0. And then this is typically very close to the chip thickness. If you look up here where we show the chip thickness on the top of the graph or cartoon, and then you look at where it's shearing, those two distances are very close, okay, to each other. So this, shear plane distance here is always gonna be longer than the depth, right? Just through geometry. The hypotenuse is gonna be longer than, a, than the leg of a right triangle. So if you can visualize this as a right triangle here. Okay, so T naught's always gonna be shorter than the hypotenuse of a right triangle, okay? So that being the case, T naught's smaller than TC, so the ratio of T naught to TC is always gonna be less than one. All right, so that kind of makes sense. And then if you take a look at this, uh, this cartoon here, I invite you to go ahead and, and practice your, um, your trigonometry and go through this and show um, that the chip thickness ratio is equal to what you see at the bottom there, okay? Um, the sine of, of phi over the cosine of phi minus alpha. And then you gotta dig a little bit on, on your geometry relationships and, and trigonometric relationships between sine and cosine, and adding and subtracting angles and, and whatnot. It's a good exercise to go through. All right. So let's go back to feed or feed rate. We had talked about that previously. And we realize that the depth of cut is related to the feed. Do you remember if it's, the, if it's smaller, larger, or the same? So how is the depth of cut related to the feed? All right, so you guys are putting C in, that's correct, right? We had talked about this previously. So you, and you actually control that, right? You control the depth. All right. So here we've got uh, some pictures of tools cutting materials. Okay, if you look at um, figure A on the upper left, right? The tool is actually to the right of the chip being formed. Okay, so here's the tool. This would be the rake face where my cursor's going up and down. Hopefully you can see that. This is the, the workpiece surface that's just been cut, okay? So you can see how the shear planes are forming, right? Shear planes are forming as you're pushing the tip of the tool into the material. Okay, if you look at a close up, you can see the shear plane here. Okay, you got the chip being formed 
going up, and this is the workpiece. So if you look at the workpiece, you can see the grains and the grain boundaries for this metal. Okay. So now I threw in some lines in this graphic for you, or in this actual picture, to show you the different um, angles and whatnot that you saw in the previous cartoons and schematics. So take a look at this and see if you can visualize where the depth of cut is, where you would label that. I'll give you a couple seconds. Okay. All right, so let's let's go ahead and take a look at that, uh, or we'll look at it in a minute. Now, now visualize where you think the rake angle is in your head, and you might want to sketch along. You know, just draw a few lines and write down where the rake angle is and where the depth of cut is. Okay, and then then think about well, how would I figure out what the chip thickness is from this graphic? So this could be a quiz question, for example, an online quiz question. I could give you this and then have you, um, have you tell me uh, how you would determine the chip thickness from this, um, from this picture. Or I might give it to you as a, as a, as a PDF and then you, know, you, you do the um, test on your own scan it in and submit it. So there's different ways I'm gonna do some assessment, okay? And then figure, you know, visualize, where's the shear angle, right? So there you go, there are the answers, right? So we've got the um, shear angle or the um, rake angle is alpha right here. It's between the purple, which I tried to draw as an orthogonal to the surface of the workpiece. It's a little bit off, but you get the idea. Okay, and this is the rake face here. Hope you can see my cursor. Okay, and then you have the this angle here. Okay, you remember what that's called? Can someone put it in the chat box? Oh, no one knows? This angle, um, is that phi? What's that called? Shear angle, excellent, good job. So that's the shear angle. And T naught is what? Someone put that in? This, depth of cut, great. So TC would be the chip width, all right. So yeah, so this is basically the chip width here. It's orthogonal to the um, to the shear plane, okay? But in reality, it's gonna be very, very close to this. This angle is small. All right. So here we see another set of um, graphics. There's one on the left and one on the right. Can you see there's a difference between the one on the left and the right? in the way the shear planes are forming and, and the shape of the shear planes. Here you see them very, very straight. Okay, this is what you would classically see. But here we see something different, right? We get the shear planes forming and then they, right? And then they have this certain angle to them, but then the angle changes. The shear planes themselves get distorted. Okay, so let's take a look at what that is. That's called secondary shear zone. So here we have the primary shear zone here. And then if you look really close, okay, you can see where the secondary um, shear zones are appearing. Okay. So both of these um, create continuous chips and continuous chips is, is usually a sign that you're cutting really well. Okay, the chip comes off in a spiral really nicely. Now, of course, if you put chip breakers on your tool, it'll break that continuous chip, okay? And there's reasons for doing that. All right, so what else can, can happen here? Um, we can get what's called a built-up edge. So you can get material building up in front of the tool, all right? And that's kind of like, 
Picture a snow plow pushing snow. Now, some of you may have never seen that. If you've come from the Midwest or been up north in the winter, you know, the snow plows are pushing the snow uh, off the roads and it, it'll start to build up some snow in front of the plow. It won't just completely come off the plow and shear off of the plow as you'd expect, it can build up. And so now the plow is pushing a bunch of material or snow in this case um, ahead of it. And then that material is actually breaking in and cutting the material. So you generally don't want a lot of built up edge forming. Okay, and if you look at the actual photograph, you can see it there. Now someone said, uh, it can form chip welding, it can fuse to the tool, and that's exactly right. You build up a lot of heat, that built up edge could actually um, um, weld onto the, onto the tool. So this is generally not a good thing, okay? All right, oh, we got a video. Let me see if I can figure out how to get to this video. Okay, take a look at it. I'm gonna run this a few times so you can hopefully see it better. So if you, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but right at the tip, you see this built up edge. So let's go ahead and start it over. So they point out what the tool is. You can see a nice sharp edge of the tool. And then every once in a while, you'll see this built up edge forming and then coming off of the tool face. Okay, and then the slow-mo part at the end is really good. You can see the, the, the built-up edge forming, and then when they remove the tool from the workpiece, you can see the, the built-up edge actually going with the, with the workpiece, which is fortunate in this case. Okay, all right, let me stop sharing this and go back to the main screen. Yeah, I threw this in here. This is kind of random. <laughs> Um, just a word about homework, um, you know, just a reminder, you're going to have some qualitative questions in your homework. So you want to write clearly and completely, and I prefer it typed. Uh, use your own words. You know, sometimes I, I check for plagiarism. Um, if you do use an external resource, that's fine. Just cite it. Okay. And, and if you're going to copy something from an external source because they have a really good way of, of saying something, then go ahead and put it in quotes and cite it. Okay. Um, and you got to show your work for all of the, the stuff you work out. So um, show all your steps clearly. These are just reminders for you. Um, and that way, when we grade it, we, we know what you're doing and can give you partial credit. If you just write an answer down and it's wrong, um, we won't give you any credit for it. And if you write an answer down and it's right, but we don't know how you got the answer, we'll probably mark off a lot. Okay, and of course, cover page and all that. So I used to start, um, start this course with chapter 21. So here you can see a, a really good video of the tool cutting into the material. Okay, so you can see it's pushing it along. And now we're getting some built up edge here. This is a really good video actually. Um, and you can see it's starting to damage the workpiece surface, right? You see little nicks in the surface and all that. So what's happening there is your surface finish is, is really bad because of that built up edge. Okay, so here's another example. Um, where they actually coated the tool. So the built up edge is still forming. Okay. But maybe not as much. Okay. So you can think of it as the snow plow being pushed in. You can also see the shear planes forming here. And these are really nasty shear planes because the force isn't concentrated just on the tip of the tool as you'd expect. The force is actually presented to the workpiece through the entire, um, the entire built up edge. So here's some high speed um, steel tool again, and it's again forming a built up edge. Okay, but it doesn't tend to stick as much.
because it's a coded tool. So you'll find out later on, we'll talk about coat, coding the, the tools with different. Okay, and then you can look at this on your own time as well, if you wanna see more. So I'm gonna give you this for homework. Um, there's a documentary you can watch from the, from the um, University of Michigan. This was done a few years back, but it's really informative. It's about 23 minutes long, okay? So um, I'll post the link, of course, and, and um, I might create a, a little um, quiz to make sure you all watch it. Here's another one. This is about three minutes long. Um, Generating suitable chip forms and sizes and evacuating them is vital to the success of any drilling operation. Unsatisfactory performance in this area can affect process security, tool life, and hole quality. This episode will provide tips on chip control when using solid carbide drills and exchangeable tip drills. Chip formation and chip evacuation is a critical issue in drilling. It is influenced by several factors, such as the workpiece material, drill tip geometry, coolant pressure, volume, and cutting data. So how do we analyze chip formation and improve the process? Understanding and reviewing the chip formation mechanism is crucial to optimize chip evacuation, the machining parameters, and for troubleshooting. When drilling with solid carbide or exchangeable tip drills, the entrance chip from entry into the workpiece is always long. This is normal. However, needles on the periphery of the starting chip may be a sign of imbalance within the process. Several factors can cause this imbalance, runouts, inclined entrance, a feed rate which is too high, unstable or weak conditions, or even corner breakage or wear. When exiting the workpiece, parts of the cutting edge will no longer be in cut. Therefore, the exit chip will look like this, which is normal. Now let's take a closer look at some typical chip shapes and sizes with this chip chart. The ultimate goal is to achieve a chip with a cone or a C shape, which is not too long as featured in this first square. If you look at the chips in the second square, they have tails that are too long, which could cause chip jamming. To shorten the chips, adjust cutting data by increasing the spindle speed. Now let's take a look at the third square. The chips are too thick, which can affect tool life. This can be improved by reducing the feed rate. Finally, chips featured in the last square are too open. This indicates a feed rate which is too low. Therefore, time and cut is too long, which affects tool life as the heat of the cutting edge may be too high. Now let's take a look at all these undesirable chip forms. They all indicate chip jamming or a tendency for chip jamming. Typical for this is scratch marks on the chips, squeezed chips, unbroken chips, chips stuck together like a train, or strings. To avoid these undesirable chip forms, adjust cutting data and make sure coolant flow is sufficient. In summary, reviewing the chip formation and taking it into consideration when selecting the appropriate cutting data, together with sufficient coolant flow, can contribute to improving chip evacuation and drill efficiency. This leads to savings in time and money, hence improved productivity, prevention of tool breakage, and reduced machine downtime. For more smart tips, contact one of our specialists or visit our website. Okay, so what are we doing when we mill things and turn things? Anybody have an idea? Write in the chat box. Removing material, awesome. We remove material. Okay, this takes a certain amount of energy to do it, right? So um, how does that energy affect what the workpiece sees and what the tool sees, right? Think about that. So you're gonna, you're gonna have to do some work on the material, right? So the work done on the material is, to you, is, is put into removing that material. So it takes a certain amount of energy to do that. Okay, so classic physics, right? What is work? Is it force divided by distance, force times distance, or force plus distance? And everybody's saying B, good job. It's force times distance. So that's the work done. 
Okay, so you have a force associated with your, your, with your tool being pushed into the material that causes the shearing of the material and, and, and results in the removal of the material. So there's a certain amount of force you have to put on that tool to get it through the material, and that's the force. And then the distance is how, how much of a cut you've done, okay? So what's the unit for work? Can anybody put something in the chat box on that? Is it watts, joules, newtons, or none of the above? All right, it's joules. Very good. You guys know your physics. So joules is what's, um, what determines the units for work. Okay, and that's force times distance, isn't it? All right, so let's take a look at this uh, table. I'll let you, you read it a little bit. I'll give you a, a, couple of, a couple of seconds to do that. Yeah, someone wrote titanium is hard on inserts. That's from Gordon. Um, absolutely, and the reason titanium is hard on inserts is because it has a very high specific energy. It's difficult to cut, okay? So we like to use aluminum for you guys in the shop because it is pretty easy to cut. And you can see that because the amount of energy um, needed to cut aluminum is less than it is for some of the other materials you see there, okay? Except for maybe magnesium alloys, that's a pretty soft material. Okay, so taking a look at that, so let's like take a look at the, the units. We have watts seconds divided by a volume, or if you do it in English units, that's horsepowers per minute, or horsepower minutes actually, divided by a volume in inch cubed. Okay, so these are the same numbers, just different units. So let's, let's think about this. You know, what is a watt second? You know, a watt second. Does anybody know what a watt second is? It's a joule, right? So joules per second is a watt, a watt second is a joule. So we've got joules divided by volume. So it's telling us how much energy does it take to remove a unit of volume for the different materials, okay? So um, you'd say, well, why didn't they just say joules per millimeter cubed? The reason is, is they like to put the watts in there because that's related to the horsepower, right? And as you can see in the other, other column header, right? Horsepower is how tough of a, of a mill or how tough of a, a lathe uh, motor you need to cut different materials. So you may have two or three different types of lathes. One might be a real heavy duty one to cut lots of materials really fast. And that would require, of course, a higher horsepower Okay, and, and the re way you decide which lathe to put it on, if it's just horsepower you're looking at, is to see um, what the um, specific energy is for the material that you're going to cut and make sure that matches. Now, you can slow down the cutting and use a lower horsepower lathe or mill. Okay. All right, so we talked about that, right, the specific energy is in joules per um, volume, which can be re rewritten as watts seconds per volume. All right, so let's take a look at this some more. Uh, let's see. Yeah, we talked about all of this. So the reason they don't, you know, the engineers and machinists don't um, call specific energy is joules per um, cubic volume is because they want to relate it to the, the machine power they need to cut the material, okay? All right, so here's an example. Um, I'm not going to give you five minutes to work on this. I just want you to think about how you would go about um, answering this question, 
Okay. So you've got a, a rod that's eight inches in diameter. You want to cut four inches, cut it down to four inches in diameter. And I think we did a, an example of this in class. Um, and the rod itself um, is 20 inches long. So you want to remove a certain amount of volume, right? You want to go from eight inches down to four inches. Okay, and then the specific energy for this material is three horsepower minutes per cubic inch. Okay, and if we look at our chart on the left, you know, something that's around three, it could be a certain type of alloy, it could be a stainless steel, um, something like that. So, you know, so let's, let's pretend we're doing stainless steel. Okay, that has three horsepower uh, minutes per cubic inch. Okay, and so now we know about what we want to accomplish. And then let's say we want to do this in one minute. Um, or perhaps you're, you're making a hundred of these things, right? So you want to do it kind of fast. Um, how much power does your lathe and motor need to be? What's the minimum power? Of course, you want to have it a little bigger than that. Okay, so think about how you would do this, um, do this calculation. Okay, I'll give you a couple seconds to think about it while I have some more coffee. Maybe sketch it out on a piece of paper. You know, take some notes while you're watching these wonderful lectures. Okay. So the process to solve this, you need to, you need to determine the total volume that you want to remove. Then you have a time. So now you've got, I want to remove a certain amount of volume in a certain amount of time. Okay, and then you have the specific energy. How much energy does it take for that volume? So now you've got energy that you need to remove that volume. You have the amount of volume and you have the time it takes to remove that volume. And from that you can determine um, what the horsepower requirements are, the minimum horsepower requirements are for your lathe or mill. Okay, and then uh, as engineers, we always want a factor of safety. So it might be, ah, I really want a lathe that's got twice the minimum horsepower so I don't fry out my, my motor. And if you remember from the previous chart, if you have dull tools, you multiply those numbers by 1.25. That's a rule of thumb. Okay, so you may be having some dull tools and you have to do, um, you, you have to put in a little bit um, of a, a safety factor, right? So typically we like safety factors that are two, three, and four times, depending on what kind of um, stuff we're, we're doing. And yes, you're right, Gordon, it's a very beefy cut in this example. You're taking away a lot of materials. Okay. All right, so this is kind of the calculation. You might want to check my work if, if 240 pi inch cubes is the right number. Um, I didn't have time before class to, to, to sketch it out and check, check my work, but um, you can kind of figure out how much volume you're going to remove, okay? And you just take the original volume and then what the volume is that you end up with, take the difference of that and that gives you the volume that you need. Okay, so go ahead and do this after class just to, to work on it. Angela says it looks right. I trust Angela. Thank you. All right, so, so let's take a look at this again and try to think of another application of this table, right? So you've got a range of energy requirements to cut a certain amount of material. And if the tool is, is dulled and you want to multiply by 1.25, okay? So from that list of materials you see there, which of those three, A, B, or C, would heat up the most, do you think? Yeah, everybody's answering already, very good. It's, it is A, it's stainless steel, right? Because it's got the higher specific energy. Okay, and the reason, you know, think about the reason for this. Well, it has a higher specific energy, but it's usually it's, it's also has to deal with the hardness a bit. 
Yeah, and magnesium is very soft, right? So let's see what, what Eric's saying. Magnesium, you could basically carve with your teeth if you really wanted to. Cool. <laughs> Yeah, you probably can. I don't know how hard your teeth are, but if you did a hardness check of your teeth and a hardness check of magnesium, I'm sure magnesium is, is much softer and easier to cut than your teeth. All right, so now we're gonna talk a little bit about temperature and that, that'll lead us into tool wear, okay? So here we have a, a relationship of the average or mean temperature of the tool Okay, and the reason it's mean is because the temperature is distributed, okay, when you're cutting. So it's proportional to the cutting speed and the feed of the tool, and that makes sense. If I'm cutting deeper, I'm gonna remove more material, so I'm gonna need more energy, and, the, and energy creates a lot of heat, okay? And so that makes sense. So the deeper the cut or the, the higher the feed, your temperature should go up. And then of course, if you're, if you're cutting faster, that's the cutting speed V, you're gonna produce more heat as well. And there are frictional forces involved as well as the forces and, and energy needed to break apart the material. Now there's these exponents there, A and B, okay? And those, those exponents are found um, experimentally for a given set of tools. Okay, so for carbide tools, you can see A is a typical number would be 0.2 and B would be 0.125. And for high-speed steel tools, it's 0.5 and 0.375. So the average temperature will be dependent on the material that you're using as your tool material, okay? So which tool will get hotter for a given work piece? Um, cutting materials, right? Carbide tool or a high-speed steel tool? So everybody's saying B, high-speed steel. Yes, it's got the higher exponents. Okay, so you can go ahead and, and do the math and put in numbers if you, if you have to do something like this on a quiz. Just put in the same B and F for both um, cases and change A and B and see which one comes out higher. Okay, so that's one way to check it. Okay, you have to be careful if they're negative exponents, correct? Which isn't the case here, right? Because then they're in the denominator. All right. So when machining aluminum, my carbide tool will get hotter than when I machine stainless. So what do you think is the case there? Is it true or false? So I'm machining aluminum. Okay, and my carbide tool is gonna get hotter than when I'm machining stainless. So you have the same tool, carbide tool. Okay, what are we getting? B is false. That's correct, right? Because you're producing, or you need more energy and you're producing more heat when you're cutting um, stainless steel because it has a higher specific energy. So I think you guys are getting this, this is great. All right, so here's another question. Um, where is the hottest part of the tool in this depiction, or the hottest part? Is it in the, is it in the um, break face? Is it at the tool tip, which is B? Is it at C? Uh, in the in the workpiece itself, is it right at the shear plane? Where do you think it would be the hottest? Everybody's saying B. Some people are saying A. Okay, so a few of you have read read the book. <laughs> All right, so it is A, right? It's gonna be hottest about a, a certain distance up on the rake face. And that's counterintuitive, right? That seems counterintuitive. So I want you to think about that because you, you're saying, well, all, all the action's happening right at the tip. Here we're breaking stuff apart, so we need energy to break those bonds. It's gonna get 
get um, hot here. And that's all true. You're going to have heat formed in all of those places, but it's going to get the hottest at A. And Gordon says, rub-a-dub-dub, -dub, it's friction. Yes. So not only do you create heat at the tip, but then now since you're pushing, remember this is all in motion. This um, tool is pushing through the material and you're going to get this chip rubbing up against the rake face and creating even more heat. Okay. So it tends to um, be the hottest right around A. And we'll, we'll have some cartoons of that. Okay, so here is a here is a, a picture of flank tool temperature. So the flank is is this um, I think is this part down here. Okay, so what do you observe? The main thing I want you to see in this picture is this is these are isotherms. So each one of these lines, right? The one that's like 400 means that this is at 400 degrees Celsius inside the chip at this point. So everything along this line is 400 degrees. Everything along this line is 450, 500, 600. So you can see as we get closer to the, the rake face, okay, you're going to get hotter, a hotter distribution of, um, of temperature. Okay, and, and it's really interesting because the chip tends to be cooler than the tool itself. Okay, and that's a really interesting thing to, to think about, right? Why would that be? You know, why would the chip not be as hot, except right where it makes contact, as the tool itself? Well, the tool has a lower thermal mass because it's smaller than the chip. The chip's constantly being formed new, and the temperature, you know, from the work surface, from the from the uh, workpiece itself is at room temperature slightly warmer, right? So this has a huge thermal sink here, the workpiece. The chip not so much and the tool even less. And Arturo says he's been burned by chips before. Yeah, the chips do get hot, but the, the temperature is being carried away by the chip. So yeah, 400 degrees Celsius will burn you, right? Uh, boiling point of water is 100 degrees to give you some kind of comparison. Okay, so if you look at um, the simulation that an engineer did to show the, the heat distribution, uh, you can see that um, that's how the heat forms. Do you guys want to see this one? Probably. Oh, titanium ignites when turning. Yeah, if it gets too hot. All right, let's see if I can actually get there. And here we go. So here you can see um, they've got the camera fixed, the camera in quotes, fixed on the tool. So you see the workpiece moving relative to the, to the tool. But as it's moving, you can see it's starting to heat up. There's friction forming um, or friction causing the higher heat further away from the tool tip. Okay, so that's pretty cool. Okay, so I'll let it run a little bit so you can absorb that. So this is probably some work done by a mechanical engineering graduate student or something doing simulations or maybe somebody who's designing tools wants to get an idea of how the heat is formed and transferred to the tool so they can design different shape tool tips, for example, or different coatings. Um, that gets a little trickier because then your material changes with depth on the tool rake face and tool tip, okay? But these are some of the uh, higher level uh, mechanical engineering type of simulations and calculations you can do as you move up towards the higher level courses. And, you know, if you go into, um, into a master's or PhD program later, these are the kind of things you would be doing. Or you can just buy a FLIR camera and take some pictures of the heat distribution and do it experimentally as well. Okay, so at the end of that simulation, you'll see the distribution look like this. So you can look at the colors and determine the, the, the temperature, right? Blue is colder 
The workpiece is at, at room temperature where it's dark blue, all the way up to this very, um, to the red, which is the hot, hotter temperatures here, okay? All right, here's another, another thing to look at. This is a kind of a tricky graphic that I want you to, to really think about and try to absorb, okay? So if you look at the x-axis, you can see that's the distance from the tool tip. So if you can see my cursor in the upper right graphic, the tool tip is right where you'd expect it at the tip of the tool. And now you go the distance from the tool tip up the rake face, right? So you go up. So you go from here up, that's the distance from the tool tip. So you can see the temperature at the tip itself is lower than at some point away from the tool tip, okay? And then if you were to sketch the temperature along this rake face based on this curve, you would see that it's hotter, you know, partway up the rake face, and then it starts to cool off again. And, as, and then when the chip leaves the rake face, it gets cool faster yet. Okay, so now this is the, the picture on the right is what we just showed. The picture on the left is the actual data collected. And you can kind of see how it makes sense. And as you go from the lower curve to the uh, higher curve on the left graphic, you can see it goes from 200 to 300 to 550 feet per minute. Okay, so that makes sense. If I run it faster, if I'm cutting more material in the same amount of time, everything's going to heat up more. Okay. And then the feed is 0 0.0055, which is what, 5.5 thousandths of an inch per revolution. Okay. All right, so let's take a look at this and see if you can apply what you what I just taught you. Um, keep losing my chat box. Um, estimate the peak rake temperature if this material and machining tool system is running at 400 feet per minute. So the graph itself only shows you two, three, and 550. So try to imagine what the curve at 400 would look like, okay? And then try to figure out where that peak temperature would be. Yeah, most of you are saying C. So for those of you who don't see it, you, you would create a line if you can see my cursor come up and then come back down between the 300 and the 500. And you can see the peaks tend to move further up as the, as the, um, the velocity is going up, the feet per minute are going up, okay? So the peak goes to the right. So that means it's moving further up the rake face and the peak itself gets higher as you run it faster. So yeah, it's about 1150. I would say the peak's about here running it at 400 feet per minute and then you come across and it's around 1150 okay so you guys got it all right we're almost done we got six minutes left time flies when you're having fun i hope um so here we can see the graph is as a fraction of of tool chip contact length measured in the direction of chip flow so it's a it's another way of plotting the similar data Okay. Okay, now here's an example where you have a built up edge. Okay. So the built up edge is to the left of the chip. This is the chip. Okay, and the tool is to the left of the built up edge. So the built up edge is actually doing the cutting in this example. So this is the hardness of the built-up edge and the hardness of the chip and the, the material itself. So someone did this experiment when they measured the hardness at different points on the, on the built-up edge that it was produced and the hardness of the chip. And you can see um, that 
the built up edge gets very, very hard. Now the built up edge is made from the material of the workpiece, isn't it? It's formed from the workpiece material, okay? So you'd say, well, it's the same material, why is it harder? You guys have any idea why it would, the built up edge would become harder than the chip or the workpiece itself? Yeah, it's been heat treated. Exactly, so we've been treating it with heat, right? And it can make the, the steel get harder through heat treatment. So that goes back to, you know, we're forming these, these chips and we're doing this cutting um, and a lot of heat is being formed. And as a result, you're heat treating the built up edge and the built up edge is gonna stay hot longer and it's gonna be under a lot of pressure um, compared to the chip and the, and the workpiece itself. Okay. Well, that's an easy answer. We already know the answer to that, so we'll continue on. Okay. So the, the material itself in this example is steel. Okay, and this is out of the book. All right, I think we'll start with chip breakers next time. Um, so our next lecture. All right, well, it was fun and entertaining, at least for Gordon, so I appreciate the feedback. And sometimes I wonder, I'm talking to a computer most of the time, but I get to see some of your faces and comments, so that keeps me engaged. All right, well, you guys have fun. I'm gonna go ahead and shut this thing down. Um, and then, yeah, you like the nano noodles in the background, okay. That's actually from an N95 um, mask. I did some imaging of that, so. All right, guys. Ladies and gentlemen, have a great day. Stay safe, stay inside. Read a lot online about engineering and maybe we'll end up being better engineers because of this virus. Take care.